All right, everyone, welcome to lecture 2-3. So this lecture is really designed to be a primer for future lectures on um, neural structures, neural development, and those sorts of things. So we're gonna talk about some physiology, um, some more details about neurodevelopment, uh, and those sorts of things. So uh, just to uh, give you an understanding about what's testable material, this is not a physiology class. I'm not gonna ask you about physiological um, things. We'll talk about action potentials, and we'll talk about that in just general terms. In your physiology class, you'll get much more detail about uh, action potentials and channels and, and things like that. But this is just to uh, get everybody on the same level uh, to start off with. So uh, within the central nervous system, there are two uh, main types of cells. There are neurons and glia. We all think about the neurons when we think about the central nervous system because they transmit the action potentials uh, and uh, store memories, things like that. Uh, there are multiple different morphologies of neurons and we'll talk about all of those different morphologies as the class progresses. Um, but right now we'll talk in general, general terms about what a kind of idealized neuron looks like and its features. But glia form a large portion of the brain. In fact, uh, there are likely to be two to ten times as many glia as neurons, depending upon the region of the brain we're talking about. Uh, so glia provide some of the structure to the central nervous system. They form things like the blood-brain barrier that protects the brain from infection and from toxins. Uh, they will also help uh, insulate the neuron so that the action potential can travel quickly uh, from one neuron to another. Uh, they also nurture the neurons. They help to recycle neurotransmitters and to provide nutrient support to the uh, neurons of the central nervous system. So they really play a critical role and as research evolves, we're understanding uh, more so how critical these glia are in uh, dysfunctions of the central nervous system. So here we have a drawing of kind of the general morphology of a neuron. Of course, we have the uh, soma of the neuron. The soma means the cell body. It's another term for the cell body of a neuron. You may also hear uh, the term perikaryon. It also means the cell body. So the cell body is that central portion where the nucleus is located. Branching out from that central portion will have a number of different structures that form the uh, functional elements that make neurons so special. So first of all, we'll uh, identify an axon hillock. The axon hillock is basically the trans, uh, the, um, the zone where the uh, cell body of the neuron uh, transfers into the axon of the neuron. So every neuron is considered to have one axon and many dendrites. The axon is considered to be the output of a neuron and the dendrites are considered to be the input source of a neuron from other neurons where synapses are mainly located. Uh, so we see one main axon here with myelin in sheathing that axon. Myelin is actually portions of the oligodendrocytes, which are glial cells that ensheath the uh, neural axon. Uh, so that increases the conductivity of the signal down the axon. There are going to be nodes between the uh, myelin sheaths and those nodes are ideally spaced in order to facilitate the transmission of that action potential down the axon. <clears throat> so we can also see numerous different dendrites branching off of uh, this axon, and, and we'll see different types of uh, neural morphologies where there may be just one dendrite and one axon or multiple dendrites uh, different branching patterns, and those types of neurons will have different names. So the action potential wave starts in a dendrite, travels down through the soma to the axon, uh, eventually to synapses with other 
neurons and in these synapses it will release the neurotransmitter that will then activate or inhibit the target neurons, the postsynaptic neurons. So in this entire slide deck, this is probably um, the slide that you should pay attention to the most, but uh, I'm an anatomist, so I can only count past 10 if I remove my shoes and socks. So I'm not testing you on numbers. I don't want you to remember specific numbers from this table. What I want you to remember is the concepts. The concepts being that different classes of neurons, uh, uh, neural axons, are different sizes and have different thicknesses of myelin sheaths. And those different sizes and thicknesses of myelin result in a different speed uh, for these action potentials to travel. So this different functionality, the speed of the action potential correlates to the different uh, types of structures that are innervated by these neurons. So in this table here, I'm showing you the different class of the neurons, the diameter of that axon, the speed at which that uh, action potential can travel down these different types of axons, whether those axons are myelinated or not, and then what types of structures are ultimately innervated. And we'll learn more about these different types of structures uh, very soon in an upcoming lecture. But you'll notice uh, that I've color-coded these. So there are some very fast axons with very fast action potentials. There's some intermediate ones in yellow, and then there's some very slow ones. We'll notice that the C fibers are the only types of fibers that are not myelinated. Uh, so those are actually pain fibers. So pain signals actually take longer to travel to the central nervous system than other types of sensory information. So for instance, say you pick up a, uh, a, or touch a hot stove or a hot pot on a stove, or you put your finger in boiling water. The first sensation you feel is of touching that object. It's a hard object, it's metal, it has a certain texture. And then moments later, your brain will receive the pain signal, oh, it's hot, and then you'll jerk your hand away. So that is a direct result of the different amounts of myelination and the different diameters of these different types of axons, which convey different sensory information. Uh, so that's what this table is really telling you. So the concepts that there are fast uh, transmissions of information and slow transmissions of information is important. So the picture I have at the bottom here, this is actually one nerve. And each nerve contains many different axons within it. Each axon within that nerve might be conveying a different modality, a different type of information to or from the central nervous system. So here we're blowing up a portion of this electron micrograph of that nerve and we can see that some of the axons in that nerve are highly myelinated and some are not myelinated at all. By looking at this image, you can actually tell which nerves are pain fibers, which nerves are proprioceptive fibers, or which nerves are, are um, part of the muscle spindle or Golgi tendon reflex uh, arcs within the spinal cord because we can notice the different amounts of myelination. So that's the important concept behind this table. Again, please do not memorize speeds or diameters or anything silly like that. I just want you to understand and know the classes of axons, what structures they innervate, and whether they're relatively fast or relatively slow. <clears throat> so we've talked about the axon, we've talked about the cell body, now let's talk about the synapses. Synapses are the uh, connections between different neurons. These connections uh, rely on, a, a, on proteins that f kind of physically link uh, these different uh, neurons together, but the information that's transmitted between the neurons is transmitted via a chemical signal within that synapse. 
So a synapse can actually be located anywhere on the cell body of another neuron. It can be located on the dendrites of a neuron, on the cell bodies of a neuron, or even on the axons of another neuron. And depending upon where that synapse is, it has relatively stronger or weaker influence on its target neuron, on the postsynaptic neuron. So a synapse that's closer to the cell body or, or closer to the uh, axon, uh, located with on the axon, that's going to have a larger influence on the activity of that neuron and its transmission down its axis than a synapse that's located on a dendrite. So it's just important to understand uh, the gradient that exists within the central nervous system and within biology in general. So here I'm showing you a fluorescent image of one, elect uh, one uh, neuron. Uh, so this one neuron has been injected with a green fluorescent dye. Uh, then the slide was stained with a red fluorescent signal to stain all of the synapsin proteins which label the synapses of a neuron. So we can see wherever the red stain uh, overlaps with the green from this one neuron, we see yellow uh, dots within this image. And so one neuron in the central nervous system can have as many as 1,000 different synapses on it throughout its entire uh, structure, dendrites, axons, and the cell body. So within our central nervous system, uh, we have approximately uh, 100 billion neurons. And if each neuron uh, has 1,000 synapses on it, that means there are 100 trillion different possible connections within the central nervous system. So the computing power of our brain is vast and it can be uh, altered in extremely fine detail. In fact, it's been estimated that the computing power of the human brain uh, is around uh, 60 petaflops. So petaflops uh, is a computing term mainly used for supercomputers, uh, floating operations per second. So the, uh, a couple years ago, the fastest supercomputers were only about 20 petaflops, but now uh, the fastest supercomputers have actually exceeded the processing power of the human brain. They've, they've reached uh, about 100 petaflops, maybe 120 petaflops uh, at the time you're watching this. It's interesting to note that it only takes about 20 years before the computing power of a supercomputer makes it into a handheld device like an iPhone. So the computing power in your cell phone, your Android, your iPhone, whatever, is about the same as the computing power of the fastest supercomputer 15 or 20 years ago. So just think about as our world is progressing and, and as technology is advancing, uh, in about 20 years we are going to have artificial intelligences in the palm of our hand that uh, are uh, more, more capable at uh, computing than we are and have complete access via the internet to the whole of human knowledge. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty amazing um, way that our technology is advancing and overcoming our own biology. So, uh, along those same lines, it's important to understand that a synapse uh, can have a variety of different functions on its target neuron. A synapse doesn't just have to be excitatory. It doesn't just have to be inhibitory. It can have varying degrees of excitability or uh, inhibition based on its uh, location on the target neuron as well as the type of neurotransmitters that are being transmitted. Uh, so, two excitatory synapses close together on a target neuron are going to have an additive effect, uh, and if they fire together, are going to have a stronger stimulatory effect 
on a, on a target neuron. At the same time, if an inhibitory neuron is firing on a target neuron, doesn't, uh, you know, it ha that target neuron is balancing the excitatory and the inhibitory uh, stimuli that it's receiving, and it has to uh, synthesize that information and determine, uh, come to a, a, a physical, uh, electrochemical, uh, you know, balance point where the neuron either fires or it doesn't. So this is all dependent upon these spatial orientations and, and synapses and the different uh, neurotransmitters, uh, the multiple synapses on one neuron. So it's important just to understand these concepts and the magnitude uh, of the variability within the central nervous system. So in this way, there are, uh, there's the potential for multiple different types of, uh, of uh, depolarization potentials on a target neuron. So there are graded potentials and action potentials. So a graded potential on a neuron is uh, confined within a specific location on the target neuron. It doesn't spread across the entire neuron. It's too weak to spread across the entire neuron. So the magnitude of that signal decreases as, uh, as the distance increases away from that synapse. And the magnitude of a graded potential can vary based on the amount of activation, the amount of neurotransmitter that's released in that synapse. An action potential, however, is propagated across the entire target neuron. Uh, so it is going to, st an action potential will stimulate the release of neurotransmitter uh, within the axons, the synapses, uh, of this target neuron and continue that firing potential to another neuron. So an action potential requires a strong enough uh, activating signal uh, for that entire neuron to depolarize. Otherwise, you just have a graded potential. And so uh, here we see in this uh, uh, electrographic uh, uh, plot we can see how multiple graded potentials can add up to become an action potential. So on the bottom of this plot, you can see the strength of the stimulus. The strength of the stimulus when it's small, such as in these first three uh, plot peaks, are going to be sub-threshold. They're not going to produce a full-on action potential. But once that uh, threshold is, re uh, is reached, once that uh, stimulation is strong enough to reach the threshold potential, that is going to create an action potential, and that action potential always reaches a certain strength of depolarization, and it propagates across the entire axon. So in this way, that information is transmitted to the next neuron in that neural chain. So this slide's got a bunch of numbers on it. It's, got, it's a, about a bunch of physiology stuff. So um, this information, except for the broad concepts of the sodium channels and the potassium channels, uh, that they exist and that they open at, you know, at certain times in the action potential. I'm not gonna test you on the numbers and the physiology, but I just need you to understand uh, this process. So um, during an action potential, there are certain different portions of this peak that we have to identify. There's the rising, uh, the pre-threshold portion. After we hit the threshold, there's the rising phase. During the rising phase, the sodium channels open and sodium rushes into the neuron. Uh, once sodium uh, rushes in uh, and it is saturated, reaches its peak, then the potassium channels open and potassium rushes out of the cell very quickly. And that's what causes the falling phase of the action potential. Now those potassium channels are delayed, so they stay open uh, past the, the threshold as it goes down past the threshold. And this forms an undershoot where the neuron becomes hyperpolarized. So during this undershoot phase, a neuron cannot be reactivated. 
So there's a delay, there's a time length in which a neuron cannot be activated too quickly, too abruptly. So there's a maximum firing rate uh, for these neurons as the potassium channels slowly close. And so the next few slides kind of try to uh, bring home this point by showing you kind of visually what's happening in the different phases. So here we're in the first phase, the resting state of the neuron. The next phase, we go to the rising portion of the action potential uh, wave where the sodium channels are open, sodium rushes in. Uh, then we hit the peak, the potassium channels open, potassium rushes out, etc., etc. Uh, so there are some important clinical associations that you need to understand about this process, which is why I'm telling you about it. These sodium channels are very sensitive and there are a number of different mutations that can change the activity of these individual ion channels. Uh, so a person with such a mutation is said to have a channelopathy because their channels have been mutated and their channels are not operating correctly. So this can uh, have consequences like delays in the onset of an action potential or delays in the uh, dynamics uh, in whatever way of the sodium and potassium channels opening and closing. So this is particularly critical in the heart, in the musculature, the cardiac muscles of the heart. So one particular syndrome called long QT syndrome in which uh, an arrhythmia develops uh, over time as the um, the repolarization of the cardiac muscle is delayed. So in these individuals, uh, if their heart rate gets too high, then their heart will begin skipping beats uh, because of the delay in these, uh, the closing of these potassium channels uh, and other such dynamics. So QT refers to the different peaks in the electrocardiogram. Uh, so I'm sure in your physiology class, you'll learn all about those different peaks of the electrocardiogram. Uh, so you'll be fine with that. Or you can, of course, uh, search uh, through your materials, your textbooks, Google, and learn about the different wave peaks of the electrocardiogram. Uh, so there are other syndromes uh, that I'm mentioning here. Uh, periodic paralysis uh, occurs in individuals uh, uh, with defects in their sodium channel. If they exercise too much, then their muscles actually undergo flaccid paralysis uh, because uh, the sodium channels are no longer functioning correctly. Uh, so these people, if they overexert themselves, they actually uh, become paralyzed. So this is an important thing to be aware of in your patients as physical therapists, of course. There are sodium channels in the retinal neurons and ganglion cells in the eye. And defects in these channels, particularly potassium channels, can result in night blindness, where the eye is not sensitive enough to detect the, uh, uh, photons in low light conditions at night. So these people um, actually uh, might have a designation on the driver's license that they're not allowed to drive at night. Uh, so that's another example. Also, febrile seizures is a very common example of channelopathies. In a febrile seizure, the high temperature is going to uh, result in changes in the conformation of the sodium channels within the neurons of a child, and um, that will result in uh, possible seizure activity. So these are all things to be aware of. That's uh, So whenever there's a structure in biology, there can be changes to that structure, and that change can result in uh, clinical conditions that you need to be aware of in your patients. Uh, so here on this slide, um, just talking about the different types of neurotransmitter receptors on the uh, target neuron. So there are ionotropic receptors, which is what we basically, I've inferred about uh, up to this point. In an ionotropic receptor, the neurotransmitter uh, binds directly to the ion channel and, and opens that channel or closes the channel, if it's inhibitory, to change the uh, electrical potential across the membrane. 
but there are also metabotropic receptors. So metabotropic receptors are slower in their action. Uh, in this case, a neurotransmitter binds to a receptor, a protein receptor on the surface of the phospholipid membrane, and that binding causes a conformational change in the receptor, uh, transmits that conformational change to a uh, signaling molecule or signaling protein within the neuron, and that signaling protein uh, perhaps will travel into the nucleus and stimulate the formation of proteins within that neuron or, or other things like that. So it's a slower process, but it can change the nature of the neuron much more so than an ionotropic receptor can. So this slide is just to um, confuse you and, and make you scared about the vast nature of the central nervous system. So uh, here on this slide, I'm showing you about um, 60 different neurotransmitters just for the, um, uh, let's see, just for the glutamate neurotransmitter. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. In fact, these are um, receptors for just ionotropic uh, uh, receptors. And so there's about 60 different types of these ionotropic receptors, and each one has a slightly different function, binds a different neurotransmitter. If we add in the metabotropic neurotransmitters, we get uh, over 100 different types of receptors within the central nervous system. So not only are there uh, different synaptic locations that can modify a neuron and uh, different excitatory or inhibitory neurons, but there are a hundred 100 different receptors that have different degrees of activity and are located in different regions of the central nervous system, which can all modify the activity of neurons within the central nervous system, changing our cognitive and automatic and autonomic behaviors. So I don't want you to memorize anything on this slide. Please do not look at this slide ever again. But the point is to convey the complexity of the central nervous system. So now the next few slides talk about the different types of neurotransmitters. And again, on these slides, I don't want you to memorize anything at this time about these slides. As we get more into the central nervous system lectures, you'll understand what these different regions of the brain are and the importance of them. But right now, just understand that a multitude of different neurotransmitters exist. Uh, uh, neurotransmitters like acetylcholine on this slide. The next slide has serotonin and it shows um, how important serotonin is for regulating uh, the activity of the central nervous system as well as dopamine. Uh, we'll talk uh, all about these different neurotransmitters later. Norepinephrine critical for um, uh, maintaining your wakefulness and arousal and attention in the central nervous system. So again, just uh, hear these names for the neurotransmitters, understand they're important, and we'll add on to this information later. But uh, an important discovery within the last decade or two we used to think that synapses contained only one type of neurotransmitter, which only had one function on a target cell. But since then, we've discovered different types of neurotransmitters bundled within the same neurotransmitter uh, vesicles. Uh, so these different types of neurotransmitters are a completely different type. They're actually made up of peptides. Peptides are small chains of amino acids which are formed uh, within the endoplasmic reticulum of the cell. So these neuropeptides have their own unique functions and can stimulate target neurons in different ways, but they can be um, collectively assembled within the vesicles of a synapse. So we're learning more and more about the complexity of the central nervous system, and the more different things we find, the less we understand how the central nervous system works in a way, because it gets so much more complex, we get less sure of the information that we learn. 
So the next few slides are about development of the central nervous system. Last time we talked about development, we talked about gastrulation and the subsequent neurulation, the formation of the neural groove and the neural tube. So we're picking up uh, at that point. We're describing now how that neural groove and the neural tube form, and then going from there. So um, these slides you can uh, read on your own. One thing I will highlight. Uh, so uh, the previous slide, this slide here is talking about how there are uh, the neural tube closes uh, centrally and that closure expands rostrally and caudally. It expands toward the head and toward the tail or toward the, the uh, bottom of the embryo. And so that process occurs throughout the length of the neural tube. After the neural tube closes, what we'll find is that the, um, the epithelial cells closest to the neural tube differentiate into cells called neural crest cells. These neural crest cells will actually detach from the um, epidermal layer and from the neural tube, and they will travel out uh, throughout the embryo to eventually form the peripheral nerves, especially the spinal ganglia, the sensory ganglia, also called the dorsal root ganglia, the spinal nerves, the cranial nerves and their ganglia, which we'll talk about in the second half of this course, uh, and other non-neuronal types like the protective uh, meningeal layers around the central nervous system. So these neural crest cells are very important. Uh, they'll form much of the structures of the face and head as well. We'll talk more about that later. So here on this slide, I'm telling you about how the process uh, occurs, how that inductive and inhibitory interaction occurs through the BMP uh, morphogens, BMP4 and 7, as well as the noggin and cordon um, uh, morphogens from the notochord. So this is getting uh, more detailed. On this slide, what I want you to understand is that there are organizing centers within the central nervous system. So different portions of the central nervous system, depending on where they're located, such as the spinal cord versus the brainstem versus the cerebellum versus the cerebrum. Those all have different functions. And that functionality has to originate from a uh, morphogenic signal or some sort of developmental signal. And these developmental signals come from the organizing regions that form between the different portions of the brain. Uh, so here we're seeing that those organizing regions divvy up the sections of the brainstem into their different functional regions and divvy up the different portions of the midbrain and the uh, prosencephalon and telencephalon using uh, some of the morphogens we're already familiar with, SHH, uh, as well as adding in things like WENT1 and uh, FGF. Uh, so you can read this slide, understand that um, the information on this slide is um, not particularly low-hanging fruit. Uh, it's not... Uh, uh, so I want you to... What I want you to understand is the concepts and I want you to know the names of these primary morphogens that we've been talking about and what they're doing in the developmental process. That's what you should take away from these different slides. And so these different um, organizing regions end up uh, producing signals that attract these neural crest cells and allow the neural crest cells to form the different cranial nerves and then the spinal nerves down the uh, neural tube. And so that process is regulated in part by important genes called Hox genes. Hox genes um, direct the segmentation 
of our bodies during development. So just understand that Hox genes exist. There are, uh, I think I removed the slide, there are a number of different Hox genes uh, for each different region of the central nervous system uh, and the body. Uh, and so they are causing the formation of the different structures of our body. So on this slide, I'm showing you the terminology between the uh, embryonic region, the developmental region, and the adult region of the central nervous system. So you may hear me use these terms in the lectures. Um, so it's important that you can understand what these terms mean when I use them. But I'm not going to have a question on the exam um, from which uh, embryological region is the cerebrum developed. Uh, that's too easy a question. Uh, so I'm um, not going to bother with that. I'm just going to assume that you know this information. <clears throat> so another important part of development is corticogenesis, understanding the, the formation of the different layers of the cerebrum. So our cerebrum is the thin one millimeter thick layer that surrounds the bumpy, that is the surface of our brains uh, throughout all of the cerebrum. And this process occurs much like the migration of neurons in the neural tube. So there are radial glial cells with processes that extend up uh, through the, um, the primordial brain, the primordial prosencephalon. And so neurons uh, form, the neurogenesis is, uh, is, being, um, is occurring in the ventricular zone where these radial glial cell bodies are. And these neurons, as they form, grab onto the processes of these radial glia and inch their way up uh, following a morphogenic gradient, which is being sent by the subplate. So the subplate is giving off these morphogens, and these new glia that are forming are inching their way up the radial glia. Once they get past that subplate, they stop, and they start differentiating into uh, full-blown neurons, adult neurons. The uh, next group of neurons that are being formed in the ventricular zone are following those up. They travel past the subplate, past the layer that was just formed, and uh, form the next layer. They stop after that subsequent layer. So in this way, we form the different functional and histologically important layers of the central nervous system. So during this process, <clears throat> the result is that we get these different uh, six layers of the cerebrum, of this one millimeter thick layer of the cerebrum. And so we'll come back to this same image multiple times throughout the semester, through, throughout these lectures, and we'll add on information about the functionality of each layer. Um, but right now, just the idea that these layers exist is important. <clears throat> Actually, during development, uh, we form more neurons than we will ever use in our adult life. So the moment we are born is the moment of our maximum number of neurons in our central nervous system. As we age and grow, our neural connections get refined and paired back. So as we, uh, as our neurons in our central nervous system randomly fire, the ones that connect to a lower motor neuron get nourished and strengthened. So you may have heard the term neurons that fire together, wire together. So the more often that a neuron fires uh, on another neuron, the stronger that synapse gets, the stronger that connection gets. And the neurons in our central nervous system when are, we are born that fire and don't activate a postsynaptic neuron, they end up dying off. 
So actually uh, about 50% of the neurons in our central nervous system have died off by the time we, we reach 30 years of age. And when we're 30, that's when our central nervous system is most efficient because that's when uh, the uh, right number of neurons are present to produce the right outputs that we need. Uh, and then um, after that peak time, you know, then uh, we start to become decrepit and aged and old like me, and we don't work as well anymore. And uh, that's the end of our usefulness. Uh, so uh, anyway, the concept here is that fire together, wire together. This is part of the learning process. This is part of what's called long-term uh, differentiation, which forms memories in our brain. So the more often you revisit this information, the more different ways you reproduce the information that you're learning and that you're being exposed to, the stronger those memories will be formed. You can't just sit there and stare at a picture in your textbook. You have to reproduce the information. You have to understand what you don't know so that you can repeat that again and again and learn it uh, better and better. So in that learning process, you're forming new synapses, you're paring back irrelevant synapses. If you got something wrong once, you have to repeat it uh, correctly even more times to pair off those wrong synapses that you formed. Uh, so anyway, that's the end for this lecture. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. See you next time.